that. We're mostly talking about things like ASP.NET, there's things like Blazor. But of course, as a Microsoft developer, you don't just live in that bubble anymore. You also have to look at what are the client side frameworks that are available. How do you combine those with the various uh, server side frameworks, with services, uh, tying it into other websites and so on and so forth. Um, so it's going to cover all of this. We're also going to talk a little bit about different cloud hosting options and in general how to host your application. Do you containerize? Do you deploy to Azure? Do you deploy on-premise? That sort of stuff. So we're going to cover a lot of ground today. You're going to see some source code, but the goal of today's presentation is not to go in-depth and, and teach you how to use those different frameworks and technologies. Uh, but instead, we'll scratch the surface. Uh, the goal is to tell you what to use and what scenario show a little bit of demos, and then also point you to some further information that's available, all free of charge, of course. Uh, and then you can dig deeper, and of course, we're here to help you with that as well. Now, I do have uh, someone monitoring the questions online. We will have a Q&A session at the end. Uh, however, feel free to post questions into the chat online as well. Uh, somebody who's then forwarding it to me uh, will keep an eye on that, and I'll try uh, to answer that as we go. Uh, it's going to be a little bit delayed because YouTube streaming always has a little bit of a about a 20 second delay or so, but we will get to all of your questions. So that's what we're here to achieve today. Let's get started with a little bit of an overview to make sure we all understand what we are talking about here. Because when we talk about web development, there really are several different scenarios that lead us to use completely different technologies and approaches. And, and most developers fall into one of the categories. And then once they're in that category, they build an application and they stick with the, with the technology or the approach that they have chosen. So for instance, if you work at Amazon uh, and you're building amazon.com, you're building a typical e-commerce experience and, and you, you exist in that bubble. Uh, but some people also have to mix and match things. So what are the different scenarios that we are talking about here? Well, first of all, there's the typical websites. Those are the, the traditional back to the roots almost type of, of web technologies. And those are very often the public sites. Amazon.com is the example that I use here. You could think about a CodeMac.com website as well. And what these sites are is they are websites that you go to, you visit a specific page, you expect a certain return and then you click around and you go to another page and, and you truly navigate. You go from page to page uh, and you're not staying inside of an application as such. The characteristic of such a site is really more that of serving up content. The content may be a Code Magazine article. The content may be something such as a product Amazon or some other e-commerce site is selling. Uh, but they're relatively interaction poor and content rich. Now, the newer type uh, of website or web application that we have uh, is really more like a rich client application. And the web really has grown into that. In the past, we always used to compare the rich client development environments, for instance, a WPF or, or um, a WinForms type of development, UWP development in Windows, those types of things versus the thin clients on the web. But that has really changed over the recent years for a while now. And what we are really looking at is web applications that are in nature very much like, uh, like a typical app where you have a menu, where you bring up forms, you interact in a rich way, and it all happens in the browser. And the browser pulls data from, from some backend, but the logic the interactivity runs inside the browser without necessarily navigating. Okay, um, And then finally, we have what I want to call a headless site or APIs or services. And those you'll need a lot, right? You'll, you'll need those as public facing APIs. You'll need that as the backend for your application so it can get to data. So most web apps these days have something like that. Now, when you think of these things, they're really quite different in nature. Somebody who's building a web app, such as Microsoft's Office Suite or, or many modern business applications, 
when you're in that type of environment, you're probably using some kind of client side framework. You're probably only getting a data from the back office. And thus you're using very different technologies, maybe a JavaScript framework or many others, as we will see today. Now, if you're building codemac.com that's serving up magazine articles, you're probably more of a server side web developer. And then again, you're using completely different technologies. You're probably using different languages. And so the scenarios, the characteristics of those types of applications are quite different. And so we'll, we'll keep all of this in mind as we are going through our presentation here today as the different things that I'll introduce to you really fit into one of these categories. And some people may say, oh, well, who still does web development like that? Or why would I need to do that? And well, maybe that's just in a different category, different type of web application than uh, you're used to building. So let's move along. Let's take a look at the different technologies that we can use as a Microsoft developer. And let's start out kind of as a warm up topic with something that is really traditional. Switch my slide here. And that is .NET 4.x. That's probably not something we're gonna talk a whole lot about here today. That's why I wanted to get it out uh, right at the start because it still is there and it still is a very viable option. So if you're building your web application, your websites on the .NET full framework platform, the 4.X platform, typically 4.8 is what you'd be using today most likely, um, then that's still perfectly viable. You have ASP.NET MVC, uh, you can use that for all kinds of things. Uh, 4.8 will continue to be distributed with future versions of Windows, thus resetting the support cycle. And so you can absolutely still use that. We have several websites that we are still running that are using .NET 4.8 and some even a little bit older. And yeah, some of them would be nice to move them to .NET Core perhaps, but frankly, there's not a big business case for doing so. Most of these sites have been moved to Azure at this point, or uh, some of them do AWS. Uh, for those of you who were in last month's uh, state of .NET, uh, that's perfectly uh, possible. We, we mostly use Azure, uh, um, to be honest. And, and that works fine, right? Now, of course, you have to understand when you're doing this, you're on an older platform, all the new things become available for .NET Core. All the new APIs, they become available for .NET Core uh, and the new samples. Everything Microsoft does, if it's not a security fix pretty much or some other high uh, priority fix, happens on .NET Core. But if you're happy with what you're getting with 4.8 or 4.x, you can absolutely still continue doing that and, and you still get a lot of the advantages uh, by moving to the cloud and all of that. But with that said, we would not start a new project today with 4.x. We would start a project of the same characteristic in .NET Core uh, and, and either uh, MVC or some other options that we'll take a look at here. So, so that's our advice. If you start something new, .NET Core is now mature enough, but don't panic if you have something on 4.x. Now, one caveat here, Microsoft will support this type of setup However, when new things become available, when new platforms become available, when things like containerization and many other things become interesting, and as they have, uh, or other similar developments, Microsoft will not go back and say, well, since we are supporting this, we have to add those features there. No, it's supported the way it is today. And that's an important thing to understand. So uh, again, if you're starting something new, go with the, the newer platforms, Otherwise, don't panic, you, you're still uh, fine there. Uh, so question online, Haven't, hasn't Microsoft uh, suggested that all the new development should be .NET Core or .NET 5? Yes, that, that is also what I'm recommending. If you are doing something new, go with .NET Core. And we'll talk about .NET 5 in a little bit, uh, but that's certainly also gonna be a viable option. Not something that you wanna deploy today, but it's not really that far off either. So let's talk about .NET Core, okay? Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, played with .NET Core yet, I highly recommend it. Uh, this session here is too short to give a complete overview of what it is. Uh, but the short version is .NET Core is 
a reimagining, a reengineering of the .NET platform because the old .NET platform, which was really made uh, in the late 90s, when you want to think about it like that, uh, was made for a different world. It was made for a world where you ran your websites, your apps uh, on your own servers. Uh, you knew exactly what was on those servers. There was no virtualization, most likely. Uh, there was no containerization. There was certainly no big thought given to breaking your app up into small pieces that efficiently run on large server farms uh, that scale to the level that we expect today. Scalability was already an issue back then, but, but not to the level that we are dealing with it today. Uh, and it was a different world, right? We didn't run different framework versions side by side and so on. But as .NET matured and as the industry moved on and the cloud especially came into the picture, it became important to support those scenarios better. And, and .NET Core is a reimagining of .NET for that new world. And it's now been around for a while. We're on version three. It's very stable. It's very feature complete. And therefore, it is a great choice for anything new you're doing. And this is about the web. But of course, .NET Core now does many other things. It has really grown to be the new .NET. Uh, it's cross-platform. It's everywhere. Uh, you can run it on Windows. You can run it on Linux. You have mobile versions and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's kind of the short version of dot, what .NET Core is. Now, if you haven't done anything with it and you want to hear more about it than this, we did do a state of .NET not that long ago where we did kind of an over, overall view of uh, all the different technologies. And I did talk about .NET Core in more detail a few months ago. And that recording of that is still available free of charge on the state of .NET website, which is comac.com slash state of .NET. Um, so that in a nutshell is what .NET Core is. I highly recommend it. So in terms of web development, what can you do with .NET Core? Well, you can build web apps, you can build websites, and you can build APIs. So it covers pretty much all the different scenarios in different ways, um, all, all three scenarios that we've discussed in the earlier slide there. Now, some of these things like web apps may be in combination with other technologies, just as, such as a, a JavaScript client-side framework. We'll also discuss those here in a minute. Uh, or you might be able to use something even like Blazor, which we'll also go into a little bit later. So very, very interesting options there. Uh, let's start with uh, probably the most basic. And I'm actually going to dip into Visual Studio here for a moment. Okay, so here is my instance of Visual Studio and we'll just go ahead and we'll create a new project here. And this is Visual Studio 2019. You pretty much want to have an evergreen version, uh, let it update itself. Uh, so you always have the latest version, you have the latest templates. And uh, one of the things I use very commonly is the ASP.NET Core web application template here. Let's go ahead and let's choose that. And I'm gonna put it into my demo folder and we'll just let it create the default. Now, when you go through this, because we chose the .NET Core uh, template, it will create a, a, a new project template, a solution template that is based on the new .NET Core runtime. So this will automatically give us cross-platform capabilities. And when I build a .NET Core web application, First of all, I can create a completely empty app and then start adding features that I would want. For instance, I could say, let's start empty and then I want to build an API type of application that returns some JSON data and uh, we'll just start out with that and add things manually. Or I can pick a more sophisticated template and that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna start picking a model view controller web application and we'll run with that. Now note that there's even some that are out of the box combined with some client side frameworks. We'll talk about those later, but it's just an interesting aspect that Microsoft out of the box supports many client side frameworks and gives you a default template where you can have some server side components, perhaps the API layer or something like that combined with a, with a rich client side framework. So we'll do that. I'll uh, uncheck some things here and click create and that like always goes out and it creates a new Visual Studio project. Now, while it's doing that, 
I'm not going to go into Visual Studio Code here. We did that in, in prior uh, Stata.net. I chose Visual Studio as, as my IDE here because I had to choose one. But you could have absolutely done this with Visual Studio Code. And uh, my Visual Studio just disappeared on me. Let's get that back up. Uh, you could have absolutely done this with, with uh, Visual Studio Code. You could have run this on a Mac. You could have used uh, an, an AP, uh, excuse me, a CLI type of approach. So you don't need to use Visual Studio's command line tools, uh, Visual Studio's visual tools, but you could use command line tools while I'm restarting Visual Studio here. Um, and do all of that uh, in many different ways. Uh, but this is one that's just as viable as many others, and let's hope Visual Studio stays up. Now I have two instances for some reason. I guess it just took a while. But in any event, I know it's a little bit of a small font here. Uh, we'll look at some, some of the things that are going on. Uh, here is the basic setup, just like .NET, uh, ASP.NET on the full framework version 4.x, you get a project structure that is essentially the same on the surface as it was in 4.x on the full framework. Now, some of the details changed. You can't just recompile an older MVC framework, uh, uh, framework based web application in core, but you will probably be able to move a lot of code over. And the core structure of this is the same. So you have controllers, you have models, you have views. Uh, it all starts with a controller. So when you hit a .NET Core MVC, application it first goes into uh, a controller in this case it created a home controller for us it has an index page the index page spins up perhaps some data goes into the database pulls some data all of this runs on the server and it then returns some sort of view and the view is defined in the view slash home folder because we have the home controller so it's based on a standard naming convention and we can look at what the index HTML page looks like here. Visual Studio being a little bit slow. There we go. So you see, this is a very, very simple page, a CS HTML page. In other words, we are combining C Sharp with HTML. Uh, it's a, a pretty simple templated HTML approach. And we could put something in here. Welcome to state of .net or something like that. And we could then go ahead and run this and you know, it's not gonna be super exciting. I'm sure most of you have done this before. Um, but what now happens is this gets compiled to the .net core platform. I'm running on Windows, but I could now just as well run this on Linux or on a Mac. I could also run this through the command line, uh, just saying .net run and Eventually, the web browser will launch somewhere and will show us our default web page. It's not going to be super exciting, uh, but you get the idea. And if this doesn't pop up soon, I'm not even going to wait. You can see here it's still building. Always takes a little longer when we do the streaming and lots of stuff is going on on my machine. But so this is an important overall thing to understand. We still have the same MVC type of approach that we had on the full framework. And, and like I said, you can convert your code over. It's not just going to run one on one, but a lot of things will work with relatively little effort as it gets converted. Okay. So that's a good starting place. A lot of people then usually ask about, well, what about old web forms? What about VB? Well, no, those things are not currently supported. So if you have one of those, um, that's still a full framework thing. Okay, so it finally got done downloading all the NuGet packages. It started in a browser here, and you'll see that we have a not very exciting website, but uh, it does run, and it's probably going to take uh, a lot less time if you try the same thing at home. Okay, I'm taking particularly long today. My fan is spinning like crazy, so it must be doing something useful, I guess. Loading symbols in the background. And so on. A lot of waiting for not very exciting website, but...
Anyway, probably not gonna wait for this to launch because it's probably just not really worth it. Give me all kinds of messages on my other screen, how it's loading stuff. So anyway, uh, you get the idea, right? So we have the same sort of um, runtime environment conceptually, but under the hood, it's really quite different. And that's what enables us to run these types of applications well on the cloud and in environments that are also more cost friendly. Because if you run an older .NET app, it just is gonna consume much more cloud resources and it's not gonna be as friendly, while the more modern approaches just work a lot better in that sense. So that's the first thing you can do. And that's gonna be a big step forward and that is a very good approach for a lot of things. And we in fact use that for a lot of production web applications uh, that are very large and sophisticated in size and that do a lot of server-side processing like codemac.com. Now we do have a, a more modern, a little bit light, more lightweight approach and that is .NET Core Razor Pages. So if you haven't looked at that, that's actually a very, very interesting things and, uh, thing. And here's our website that finally started. So we're just gonna shut that back down. Um, so let's go ahead, go back into Visual Studio and let's do another new project here. Things are really slow on my machine for some reason. Having two Visual Studios is not the best of ideas. But anyway, so we'll create another .NET Core web application. Just go with the default. And this time in our secondary dialogue here, we'll, we'll choose slightly different options. Uh, and what we're gonna do this time is we'll choose uh, the Razor Pages options. Now, what's the idea behind Razor Pages? Well, when you look at what happens with the typical MVC web application is you tend to have these controllers and these controllers may not be doing very much. They just say, oh, load this data, load this, uh, this page. And in the actual controller, there's very little code. And this new web application template, which uh, when you look here in the, in the text, it says it creates a Razor Pages app. When you create that, it foregoes the controller approach. So it creates a .NET Core web app. It's based on the same technology, but it configures slightly different features. So rather than routing all the requests into a controller, it is going to route the requests straight into pages. Now, a lot of people say, oh, wait a minute, this is like old web forms. Well, conceptually, it is a little bit. It's just web forms done in a newer way if you want to think about it like that. Or it's a streamlined version of doing uh, ASP.NET MVC without the controller, right? So in this case, you see the folder structure is a little bit different. We start out with pages. If we dug into the startup and program code, we'd see slightly different features being configured. Um, but we're gonna forego that today. But we'll dig into the index CSHTML page and note that this is very, very similar. So a lot of people say, hey, wait a minute, this, is, this literally is just streamlined MVC. And in some ways it is, right? So the only thing that makes this a Razor page is this at page directive at the top. That's make, that makes it a page that can directly respond to this request that is coming in, right? So the actual um, routing works in a way that's quite similar to how it worked with MVC, except the route just goes straight into the page. Now the page uses a model called index model, and we can actually uh, dig into that. So we'll F12, the index model here. And here is that model. And note that this model inherits from a page model. The page model is a specific Razor page model object that provides certain capabilities. 
For instance, it provides an onGet method. So a model that has an onGet method will trigger that method if somebody tries to perform an HTTP GET of that index page. In other words, as we navigate to the index page, this onGet method will fire and therefore it's similar to the method in the controller that returned a few actions. So this is the code, uh, the place in code where we would put the, the code that accesses data, for instance, and things of that nature. Now there's also an on post, and so there's different kinds of, of methods that you can call. So that's where your code would go, typically. You could, of course, also put a lot of code straight into the page here, uh, into this block, for instance, but it's better form to put it into the index model. And then whatever you have in this page here, without going into too much detail, whatever you have in this page here can be templated to bind to that model. And again, what you have in this page is gonna be very similar to what you would have in the view of an MVC application. So again, a lot of people think, well, this is really just a, a slightly different way of doing uh, an MVC app. When you dig deeper, the concepts are actually a little bit different. Uh, the concepts that apply to Razor pages are probably not so much MVC and they're more MVVM. In other words, you have a stateful view model that you bind to and the Razor pages uh, manage a lot of that. You have two-way data binding and, and things like that. And that makes it a very, very appealing uh, model to build the typical web page that needs to do data entry and needs to do data binding and, and posts back to the server and so on and so forth. So a very good way to go and a lot of people use this Razor page approach over the older MVC approach or, or the more classical MVC approach. I don't want to call it old. Uh, now there is this conception that Razor pages, that they're a little bit of a beginner's thing, right? It's an easier way to enter uh, the ASP.NET world. And perhaps that's how it was originally started. Maybe that's how Microsoft conceived it originally. Today, this is actually what Microsoft recommends for most web scenarios. So you can use this approach uh, as kind of your default. And most people these days go to the MVC approach if they need uh, more control, more fine grained control, kind of the more sophisticated, heavy duty websites, if you will. Uh, question online is, do we know the level of adoption is for Razor pages over the standard MVC model? I do not have that data. We can probably dig it up, um, but it's a significant amount now. And then of course, it's, it's very difficult to get that data also because you can actually mix and match the two approaches if you want. Uh, but it's, uh, it's something that I see a lot of talk about, so uh, it's definitely becoming more and more popular. Okay. The final thing I want to mention here in, in this .NET Core overview is the services. I'm not going to go into a big example here, but rest assured services is very well supported. By services, I mean APIs, RESTful services, gRPC is a new thing that is now supported. So there's many different ways of uh, doing these types of services straight out of, of MVC on the server side. And in many apps that we see today, where there is a lot of client side stuff, that's actually the majority of what .NET Core is being used for then. So that's pretty clear. What's not as clear and what we always get a lot of question for uh, is when should you use MVC and when should you use Razor Pages? Again, Microsoft now kind of promotes Razor Pages as the default approach. And I think if you have an application that is very data-driven, uh, a typical, you know, um, sign up for an event perhaps, right? Or uh, any anything where you enter data on a website, uh, it, it really benefits from the simple Razor Pages approach, okay? Um, if you have a website that's not so much driven by this templated HTML idea, then perhaps an MVC model is the better approach. Now, let me give you an example. Um, we run a free product called Kava Docs. Let me uh, bring that up in the browser real quick. I'll show you an example of that. If I can get my browser to load slowly but surely. 
here it is. Now Kava Docs is a documentation product and we use it for things such as our code framework, uh, application development framework. And we can go to the docs for that at docs.codeframework.io. And here you'll find something that is very much like the Microsoft documentation website, right? So I can dig in here and I can find out about how to develop uh, with our uh, framework. And this is a lot of content. But as you can see, there's not a lot of interactivity as such. There's not a lot of things where you go, oh, I'll template that, right? I'll, I'll put a text box and I bind it to data and I put a label and I bind that to some data and I have 50 of those and a submit button and so on. Instead, this does some very sophisticated processing of content behind the scenes, generates HTML on a very low level. There's a lot of advanced caching and manipulation and then spits out that HTML. And for that, we use MVC because we really don't get much benefit from a razor page. Our razor page would be a one-liner that says content goes here. And so for that, MVC is great. Another example would be if you sign up for Code Magazine, you go to the subscription page. That subscription page is so sophisticated in all the different things it can do and show and and it's really not a good example for a templated HTML thing, believe it or not. Uh, so for that, we use MVC. But if you come to our website and you post an, a, a job resume to our website because you'd like to work for us, that page that's a typical data entry form is a very good example for a templated HTML page. And for that, we would use Razor Pages. So those are, that's kind of how we differentiate between the few. Now, I understand most developers build apps that are more like templated web pages. And therefore, I think Microsoft does a good job uh, suggesting Razor Pages is the default uh, for web development these days. And you'll see that because like all the samples, for instance, usually they now become available first for Razor Pages. Um, Question online is, does Razor and MVC have client-side differences? Well, it all runs on the server, right? So in, in what it sends to the client, that's the same. And you could embed JavaScript and even frameworks like Vue into the client-side stuff that you send back. And whether you use Razor or MVC makes no difference. But on the server, it makes a difference because you can do things like data binding a little bit different in Razor. Now, a little bit of a side note that I want to throw in here. I want to mention, since we talked about building services, RESTful services, gRPC services, that sort of stuff. I also want to throw in uh, Code Framework here, since we already looked at the docs. Code Framework is our application framework that you can use to build various things, anything from Windows apps to web apps to uh, a lot of services. And services is probably the most used feature uh, by the community of uh, Code Framework. And so I just wanted to mention that you can go to uh, codeframework.io and get all the, the latest stuff. You can go to GitHub, get the latest stuff. I'm not trying to sell you something here. This is free. This is open source. The cool thing about this is it's an alternative way to do services. Uh, when we build services in Code Framework, what we do is uh, we build objects that return data. And there's very few limitations as to how those objects have to work. And when you build your services like that, you can then return uh, JSON, you can use uh, REST, you can use gRPC, you can use older, older protocols. It's completely agnostic to the protocols you're using. You can even do things like Azure functions and so on. So that's also something, take a look at it. We have lots of documentation available, codeframework.io. I think I have a slide later that has the link in it. Um, and, and again, it's free and open source. So I just wanted to mention that here as well. Uh, another question we have online, would Razor be a better choice uh, than C Sharp APIs and React? That is a, a very good question that we are about to uh, take a closer look at here actually, but the short version is it completely depends on what scenario you have. If you have a typical website, then you want to do server-side processing, right? So when you uh, go to codemac.com and you look at an online article, I'm not going to load up a big web app and then navigate through some routing mechanism and then pull 
uh, the content of the article across and have React do some formatting on that article uh, because it would be slow, it would be not very good for search indexing and so on. Uh, so I would use a server-side approach to that. But if I'm building something that's more like an app, like our in-house system that we use to manage the magazine, for instance, then I would go with some kind of client-side framework and then React is one of those choices. Uh, so it's more of a scenario choice than what language do you want to use. Anyway, returning to .NET Core, uh, .NET Core now has a very lengthy roadmap. Uh, we are well into this, as you can see. So .NET Core 3.1 was released in November of last year. So we are coming up on a year here uh, relatively shortly, I guess. And like I said, it's a very, very stable version of .NET Core. And I highly recommend that you use this. Now, we are already coming up on the next release and it's not .NET 4, instead it's .NET 5, I guess to get out of versioning conflicts with the full framework and 4.x. Uh, so .NET 5 uh, was also codenamed 1.NET or, or often referred to as 1.NET and that gives you an idea of what that is supposed to do. Uh, it is supposed to be a unification of all the different .NET flavors that we now have. It's a continuation of the .NET Core timeline with the other things being brought back into that fold. So we'll see a release of that in November 2020. You can download a lot of those preview components right now. They are pretty stable at this point. I wouldn't use them to go live, but you can play around with it. And then come November, um, you will have that next version. Now, Microsoft alternates, alternates between uh, light, uh, long term support and just more in between releases. So technically, .NET 5 will be an in between release, but on a day to day basis, this probably doesn't mean a lot. It just means that come November 2021, when .NET 6 will be released, that'll be another long term support version. You'll merge your .NET 5 stuff into that, and then .NET 5 uh, will be on short term support, and then .NET 6 will be the next long term. And so it's going to alternate like that. Um, few more questions. Uh, I, I see my guys already telling me to uh, keep questions for later. But uh, quick question about Code Framework: Does it support SOAP clients? Yes, it does. So you can do SOAP. Uh, you can also do WCF, but not on the core. There's a little bit of the ramblings going on behind the scenes of making WCF for .NET Core kind of a community effort, but I'm heard that going anywhere lately. Uh, but it is still alive in Windows, right? It's still alive as the full framework and uh, .NET Core as such doesn't support it, but we support it in Code Framework. So if you're building a Code Framework service, that service can be run in the full framework and you can host it unchanged and expose it as WCF. Uh, so yeah, it's still alive but it's not a big thing going forward. We're now talking more about REST and for the binary stuff, we're talking about gRPC, which are well supported now. Um, but if you're in WCF, it's, it's not a dead end at, at this point. So anyway, .NET 5 um, will release in November. We are currently looking at what we can do for state of .NET events. Uh, I would love to do one in October. We'll see if Microsoft is uh, fine with us spilling the beans in October or whether we'll have to wait wait till November. Uh, but it will be, we will focus uh, a state of .NET on .NET 5, of course. We're also working on a ton of magazine content. We will talk about .NET 5 in the magazine, which you now, if you're in this event, you all have free access to. It's also online available and in a mobile app uh, free of charge. Uh, so we'll have that and we're working on a special issue, a focus issue as we call it, that will coincide with the release of .NET 5. So it'll be a full issue just focusing on .NET 5 as an additional issue we'll publish this year. And uh, .NET Conference, .NET Conf .net, uh, will be an online event November 10th to 12th for the release of uh, .NET 5 and you can sign up for free. This is a Microsoft thing that you can sign up for free as well. Um, and we have a bunch of other questions. I'll, I'll keep some of those till the end uh, because we are already running out of time. 
Now the next topic that's really exciting is Blazor. Blazor is essentially an alternative to everything I've just told you. It's a web framework from Microsoft that has now been released. It's based on .NET Core and it essentially does many of the things that I've just showed you. Now the main thing about Blazor is that it's a client-side framework. It will run or it does run inside the browser. So what you can do is you can write an application that's in nature a web app. So it falls into the web app category and that web app is running inside the browser. But the cool thing and the really unique thing and the real reason why it makes sense to have yet another client side framework is that it's based on .NET code. So you can create C sharp code compile it like always. You can even use things that you've already compiled and include them, so existing DLLs, and you then deploy it into the browser and it runs in the browser on the client. And it does this with a technology known as WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a standard that allows compiler builders to essentially create an alternative to JavaScript that runs in the client. So that's how the Blazor idea started. Uh, now, Microsoft then also implemented a server-side version that is almost syntax compatible to the client-side version or, or fully syntax compatible. The only difference is that you typically do things a little different, such as accessing data, because if you are on the server, you can just open a connection to SQL, for instance, while if you were on the client, you couldn't. So there's a little bit of paradigm shift going on there. But other than that, those two versions are almost identical. And so this provides an interesting alternative. Now, my personal opinion is if I do Blazor, I want the client side stuff. I, I think the server side stuff is more of a, you know, a fallback option to me personally. Maybe people have different opinions about this, but to me, Blazor is exciting on the client, right? So that is why we need Blazor. That is why it's uh, different from JavaScript, right? It's strange that on the web we were trapped in this thing uh, in this world where we only had JavaScript and we had no choice of languages and JavaScript's great for a lot of things but so are other languages why don't we have that choice and with WebAssembly we get that choice back and Microsoft is providing us a way to do C-sharp development that way okay and I have a few slides in here I don't have a huge amount of time to spend on this but I wanted to put this in here uh, so you can read up on this. In simple terms, WebAssembly is the standard for uh, running binary code in web browsers. It's almost as good as pure assembly code. There's a little bit of overhead because it's cross platforms. It, it runs on mobile devices. It runs on the Mac. It runs on Windows. It runs on Linux, all those things. Uh, so it's not 100% on the metal, but it's very, very close. It's essentially native performance for the web. Um, can be a target for any language. Other compiler builders can support this as well. It's available in all the major browsers. And the question online is, can you use Blazor for production? Yes, you can. Even client-side Blazor was released a few months ago. I think I actually have a slide that tells us exactly when it was released, but it's now been out for a few months and you can absolutely use uh, even client-side Blazor for production. And server-side Blazor was released in November, actually. So uh, that is the short version of that. And I, I have a, a few things that are advantages here uh, that to me are the most important ones, the C-sharp language, that I can not just use that in the browser because I, I like the language and I have the skill. Those are big things, but also because I can reuse code I already have. So I can reuse existing business logic, for instance. The tooling, the IDE is great. You can use Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code. Uh, you have lots of tools, very, very rich environment. It's a stable environment. That is a huge thing to me. If you look at how stable C Sharp has been over the years compared to what you go through with JavaScript frameworks, that's a big difference. Uh, has a huge ecosystem. People are very excited about this. So it is already a, lot, a big open source community and lots of free stuff you can get. It is completely based on standards. A lot of people go, oh, Microsoft's doing something weird again. You know, that it's, we've had this with Silverlight and it didn't catch on. And 
Uh, and now they're doing this weird WebAssembly thing that's just theirs. That is not at all true. Uh, it is based on standards. WebAssembly is an open standard. It had nothing to do with Microsoft. You're using HTML. You're using CSS. So you're fully standards compliant. Code reuse is a big one. It's component based. The framework Microsoft spun around Blazor is really nice. So you get a lot better reuse and the syntax is really nice. And of course, if you're a .NET developer, which you probably are if you're in this presentation, you get to reuse skill. And whether that's your own skill or whether you're a team lead and you have a group of people who are already very proficient in .NET, uh, you know, that's also often uh, a big uh, benefit. Now, there's another question online. Uh, what do I think of Uno compared to Blazor, Xamarin Forms? I'm really not qualified to answer that question, fortunately. Uh, I have no experience with Uno. Okay, client side, server side, we talked about that. Here is uh, the release when it was released uh, with the 3.13 version of the .NET Core SDK, which was three, four months ago, maybe. So it's been around for a little bit. And you can get more information at blazer.net. Now, what browsers can you use it in? That is one question that I get all the time. And you see that all the major browsers and platforms support WebAssembly. So the new Chromium Edge, the old Edge, Chrome, Firefox, Opera, Safari, Linux, Mac, Windows, Android, iOS, they all support this technology. Now you'll notice there's one major browser that's missing in here, and that is Internet Explorer. If you're using Internet Explorer, it does not support WebAssembly, it never will. It's a browser that's dead, try to not use it. I understand that a lot of people have to use it. In that case, Blazor is not for you, right? WebAssembly is not for you. You could still use server-side Blazor. Um, a lot of people say, well, let's start with server-side Blazor. I can then go to client-side. You have to be very careful with that because of things like how do you access data and, and that leads to differences in what people actually code. So, so that I wouldn't take as a, a slam dunk clean path. Uh, but unless you're using IE, you can uh, absolutely use it. Uh, there's a question about separation of concerns, I'm assuming related to Blazor. Uh, does it go against separation of concerns? No, it doesn't. It, it, Blazor really doesn't do anything for that. Blazor just provides you the compilation environment and a little bit of a UI framework. But the way you architect your app is still up to you. And yes, you should pay attention to the separation of concerns and still do proper architecture. So it doesn't really guide your architecture. It's not, not introducing an opinion about architecture or, or mushing stuff together. Um, so that's still up to you. And I agree that you should pay attention to that. Uh, question, can you handle an Ajax kind of request with Blazor? Well, you could because you could, it's still HTML at the end of the day. You're really just replacing the coding part of it. So you could have an Ajax type of thing. You could call back to the server. Uh, a lot of times you don't have to because now you have client -side .NET code. So a lot of things that you had to go back to the server for in an Ajax world, you just do in the, in the browser now and the browser becomes your rich environment. But of course, sometimes you have to pull more data and stuff like that. And yes, and then you could absolutely do that. Okay, uh, one more thing about Blazor here. Blazor has been super popular. Uh, we've done a state of .NET about Blazor relatively, I think two months back. Uh, we've done magazine content, all kinds of stuff that is available to you for free. If you go to codemac.com slash stata.net, you can go back and watch my in-depth uh, detail blazer stata.net with lots of samples and, and I dig into a lot of stuff there. And then also look on codemac.com for content. We have a ton of blazer content. And we'd like some more feedback. We're thinking about doing more blazer stuff in the future, maybe more like real training, maybe just some more online seminars, maybe a series of seminars. Uh, tell us what you'd like to see. We always like to hear some feedback and that's why we do the survey. So um, that is something that we're looking for feedback on. Okay, um, that's an old slide. So people always ask me, how do I switch between Blazor and MVC or Razor? 
Um, I think you don't truly choose between those two. I think what you do first is you choose whether you fall into the web app category or whether you fall into the website category. If you fall into the website category, you probably want server-side code running. You do either MVC or Raisin. We already talked about those decisions. If you're doing client-side stuff and you want to use .NET as a language, you're using Blazor. But the decision becomes more between Blazor and other client-side frameworks. Okay, so that's... Uh, Blazor versus MVC is really not a big, uh, big decision to make. Uh, as a question, would this uh, be a way to extend your web apps to mobile? Yes, it would. Yeah, you can uh, do progressive web apps, for instance, through Blazor very well, and they can then be installed on mobile like a real app. And, and now that Blazor is fundamentally working and we have this .NET code in the browser scenario, we can now think of a lot of other scenarios where we could use Blazor to run in the browser. But let's uh, move on. Uh, still lots of stuff to explore here. Uh, let's talk about the alternatives for Blazor. And I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly because in a lot of ways they don't truly fall into the Microsoft side of things. And we are doing a state of Microsoft web development. But the reality is if you are a Microsoft web developer, you will probably have to venture into some of those client-side frameworks as well. Um, and the most popular ones of those are Angular, Vue.js, and React. They all have the benefits. We use them all. We love them. Um, some more so than others. Uh, and they all have their unique advantages and disadvantages. But all three of them, as well as Blazor, are now viable options for client-side web application development and I picked up some stuff that uh, somebody on the on the web sent me uh, summing up the three different frameworks very nicely a big one of course is angular angular is Google's rich client web application framework it's the most mature of all the frameworks that are out there at this point has good backing in terms of the people contributing and it is of course backed by Google in that sense so you have a big player behind it. The downside of it is it's quite opinionated. In other words it tells you how to do things and therefore in order to be proficient with it you have to learn how Angular wants you to do stuff and so the learning curve can be a little steep uh, and that's off-putting to some new developers uh, but it is a pretty cool environment and, and we use it for a lot of the web applications that we build for us internally as well as for our customers and are using it very successfully. It, it's a good choice, I feel, especially for large companies, uh, especially if you're already using TypeScript. That is uh, what Angular uses by default. So that kind of makes it a good thing. Um, and and that's, that's it for Angular, pretty much. Question online, what about Xamarin? Will it be replaced by MAUI? MAUI is uh, Microsoft's new application UI technology that actually came from Xamarin. So it's a, a continuation of Xamarin. And uh, that's really different, right? That's, just, that's not so much of a web application technology. It's more of a mobile uh, slash cross-platform for the desktop technology. Uh, so we'll probably talk about that in a future state of .NET, um, but it doesn't really fall so much under the web one. But it's a, a very interesting technology. Question also is, what's a progressive web app? It's a web app that you can essentially compile into a shell and then it installs and it looks more like a regular app. You can run it from the start menu. You can run it from the home screen with an icon on a phone, for instance. It just looks like an app, even though it's really a browser without an outer shell can also run offline and so on. So that's Angular, good choice, a little bit harder to learn, a little bit opinionated. React is the counterpart from Facebook. Uh, it's also relatively mature, has a huge community behind it, very widespread acceptance. Probably if you're looking for a job, the job market for React is huge. Uh, so that is where we see people looking for the most developers and uh, certainly a framework where you expect it to go forward for a long time. Um, React is a little less opinionated. Uh, it usually gets combined with other things. Uh, it's 
a little bit different in approach. Uh, it doesn't really use two-way data binding. Uh, it's more of an immutable, I and mean, when something changes, let's recreate the front end. But that's not something you worry about a huge amount. It's a little bit of a different paradigm, uh, but it works quite well in that. Uh, and what it does is it, it's operating based on these JSX files where you are basically mixing JavaScript and HTML that appeals to some people, other people feel it's, it makes a huge mess. So it's really just a matter of how much do you like it, but certainly it's a good choice that a lot of people use and that probably has a very long future. And then we have the newcomer, relatively speaking, and that is Few or Few.js as its uh, more proper name is. Uh, Few.js is more of a community framework it grew out of Angular. A lot of people say it's the best part of Angular without the difficult or cumbersome parts. Um, and it's something that has been gaining a lot of momentum lately. Uh, to me, it's almost the nicest, smoothest way of doing client-side JavaScript development. Within code consulting, within EPS, within my company, it gets used quite a bit. Uh, we don't dictate which frameworks people need to use. A lot of time that actually is driven by the customer. But I noticed that when people have a choice, it seems that uh, our people now mostly gravitate towards, towards few when in the past it was Angular. So a very friendly, very large thing at this point uh, gets picked up by a lot of large companies but it doesn't have this big pub, uh, like a Facebook or a Google as a backer behind it, but it's certainly just going very strong from the community. Question online is, is, is uh, React a framework or a library? Uh, I guess when you ask the question like that, I would almost lean towards calling it a library, but I, yeah, it's, Things are called framework versus library these days. And, and in the old days, to me, framework was much bigger than what many frameworks are these days. So uh, I guess it's a, it's a scale. But when you, when, when you ask the question like that, yeah, let's call it a library is what I would say. Um, and is few good with the file system? I'm not sure what that means. Does it mean accessing files? That would be just JavaScript then. So none of these frameworks are any better or, or worse at uh, running the JavaScript code. They're all JavaScript behind the scenes. If, it's the, if the question is more how big is it, few is the smallest of them. It's a little more streamlined. Uh, all these frameworks, uh, the question is are they using raw JavaScript or jQuery? Uh, none of them use jQuery, but you can combine them with jQuery. We do that at times. Uh, people will poo-poo that a little bit and say it's not the real, the right way to go, but sometimes it's just easy. But in general, these frameworks have replacements for much of what jQuery used to do, so you don't need to use jQuery. So it's raw JavaScript in that sense, but it's not raw in the sense that they provide that functionality on their own. Now, how popular are these? It's really, really difficult to say how popular they are because... You know, the, there's no sales stats, they're open source, you can look at downloads, but then they download so differently, they come from package managers and how many downloads are just rebuilds versus uh, a real new user and so on. So one way of looking at it is looking at uh, projects on GitHub and, and GitHub stars. And this gives us a rough trend. We see that Vue is on a very, very rapid growth pattern. We know that Facebook is really popular. Uh, we know that Angular has fallen behind a little bit, but it's still going really, really strong. Now we could look at this in different ways. In other ways, by looking at job openings and so on, uh, then we would see that React is super strong. So all in all, I felt this was one of the more representative stats that I found. Maybe few is looking a little too crazy here. I think React in pure numbers, you'd find a lot of stats where React is in the lead. Um, but but they all, all three are fine choices if you want to go with a JavaScript framework at this point. So that's the overview in that. So what have we seen so far? We've seen that server-side, if we do something server-side, 
.NET Core is great. If it's templated HTML, go with Razor Pages. If it's more sophisticated, low-level stuff, go with MVC. Both are fine choices. If you're doing client-side stuff, Blazor looks to be a great choice. We don't have good stats yet as to how many people are using it. I can tell you that it's some of the most popular content we have. People are really taking the Blazor a lot and we get a lot of questions about that and, and we know that people watch our stuff and read a lot of Blazor articles. But it remains to be seen how well it's doing in production. We are starting to use it as an alternative to uh, Vue and Angular and React uh, internally quite a bit. But certainly the other three are great choices and uh, largely a matter of personal like. If you're looking for a job at this point, React is probably a great way to go and a good skill to learn. Now, I wanted to talk briefly about some development choices. Uh, this is not core to my talk here today, which is why I'm going to go through it very, very quickly. But I just uh, wanted to mention uh, some, some aspects here. Uh, first of all, containers. Containerization is a big thing these days. So if you haven't looked into containers, again, our general, uh, st I think the oldest state of that net, not state of .NET recording that's on the site right now has information about this. The short version is it's, it's almost like app virtualization. You build an app, you stick it into this bundle that we call a container that can have everything built in from the framework to even the Linux build or Windows build. And then you can deploy that whole container and it's guaranteed to work the way you deployed it because it's in that container. And then you can build large farms and you can orchestrate them and spin them up and and containers in general are everywhere, even you know, deployed to IoT devices and all kinds of stuff. But for web development, it's usually about farming, a big server farm and scalability. Uh, and Docker is the container that is the one that everybody uses. Kubernetes is the service that has become the standard to managing containerized deployments on various platforms like Azure and, and AWS and so on. And so that's definitely something that you should probably look into, that you should be aware of these days. Now, does every app need to be deployed as a container, as a Docker container in a Kubernetes swarm? No, it does not. Uh, in fact, if you're building something that's a little smaller, then this may be overkill. Uh, so we had some experience with that for our Code Magazine website, which takes a fair amount of load. But we deployed that uh, through a, a swarm and it took a lot of infrastructure to do that. And it turned out to be overkill. Uh, we went back, now it's running just as, a, as an Azure application service and that scales and works fine. And it's much cheaper for us. But if you're building something that gets beyond that, then this is definitely something you want to look into. So at least you should be aware of what it does. And I see there's some questions online. I'll take them a little bit later. Now, one of the other questions I always get is we talk a lot about the cloud. All these new technologies talk about the cloud. Can I not deploy this stuff into my own data center anymore? And I want to be very clear on this. Absolutely. Can you deploy this stuff into your own data center? So if you have a data center, a server room, whatever, you can still deploy .NET Core and containers and all that stuff to that as well. So just because we don't talk about that so much, be aware that that's still possible um, and uh, uh, certainly what you can do. But it's very common to deploy into Azure app services. If you're building a typical ASP.NET web app, MVC, Razor Pages, server-side Blazor, even client-side Blazor can be served up from this. You can use an Azure web, an Azure app service and you have integrated ways from Visual Studio to deploy, great ways to deploy through DevOps. Take a look at our Azure State of .NET that is also available free of charge that recording uh, as to how you can use a lot of that stuff. So that's really easy, a good way to run your web application. Now, Amazon does the same, different ways of doing it. Elastic Beanstalk is one of them. It's not the only one. Last month's State of .NET was about that. So again, take a look at that. But that's all good ways of deploying your ASP.NET based web apps as well as the ones that are client side. Now, when you have a pure client side website, say you're building an app that is literally just static HTML pages that get sent to the client and then it's all JavaScript or all Blazor, 
then the question is, do you really need a server that runs ASP.NET on, on the server? Um, the answer is no, you don't. You can have a very simple web server that just serves up static content. And Microsoft has put in preview a new Azure service called Azure Static Web Apps that do exactly that. It's a highly efficient, lower cost, highly scalable way of deploying that static web content. It's integrated into DevOps through GitHub. That's the only way to do it at this point. It will probably change over time. Uh, so that's a good and very interesting way to go. It's a preview right now, but this I think will be very interesting. And then a lot of time what happens is you just need to access your data somehow through a service. And that could happen through something like Azure Functions, which is another thing uh, that I have a slide for here. What is Azure Functions? Azure Functions is serverless computing which is the most confusingly named thing ever. What serverless computing means is there absolutely still is a server. It's just you don't have to worry about it. You just have some code, you want it to run, and you deploy it into this thing called Azure Functions. And you can build this in JavaScript, many other languages, but you can also build it in C Sharp and .NET Core. So this is yet again another alternative way of building APIs, building RESTful interfaces, for instance. Um, it can be used for APIs because what it does is it fundamentally responds to events. That's what Azure Functions are. It's a piece of code that, re that responds to an event. That event could be an HTML request, but it can be other things like timers, database events, messages you receive, and so on. Uh, you could technically build a whole website like that where you just have HTTP GET events and it returns back some HTML. So that would absolutely work, but there's no real framework around that and you don't wanna really do that, I guess, for that reason. But it's a great option for hosted APIs and just another way to build .NET code and host it on Azure. And again, the Azure Stata.NET shows you how to do that. One of the things I want to point out here, there's a cold start penalty. If your Azure functions are not very busy and then a day later they get hit again, the first time they start up, they may not be super fast. Amazon Lambdas is the counterpart of that on Amazon. Again, last month, Stata.net talked about that. We also have uh, the current Code Magazine issue talks about that. You can go online, find that article for free or use our web app. Okay, well, that takes us through the main content. I have a few other announcements uh, that I want to go through. And that's going to be very, very quick. And then we'll get to the session. So again, remember that survey, uh, Jim said, last month's survey produced this data.net because people wanted to hear about this type of stuff. Uh, tell us what you want to hear about in the future, other things uh, that you're interested in and so on. Uh, so that really helps us out as we plan these events, uh, knowing what people want. So that's that. As Jim mentioned uh, in the intro, if you now sit there thinking, hmm, I wonder how this applies to my thing. I have some questions, but you know, that's really too big a question to ask right now. Ping us, consider us a resource. We're not the kind of company that's gonna send you an invoice for a short answer uh, in email. In fact, we offer you this uh, free hour of consulting uh, doesn't have to be exactly an hour. If it's an hour and 30 minutes, we won't charge you either. So feel free to consider us a resource and we're more than happy to discuss with you how this applies to you or whatever your question might be. I want to point out we have a new code mobile app for iOS and Android. If you have any kind of Code Magazine subscription, we are currently during this Corona crisis running this app in a special mode where access to absolutely all our content that we ever published is free through this app. And in fact, well, if you're in this session, you are entitled to a free subscription anyway, so you have this. And if you have somebody else who wants this, we even have a free link that gives people a free subscription right now. So contact us about that as well. Uh, Code Magazine currently is a benefit to all Microsoft customers. So if you haven't activated this or you know somebody, uh, Microsoft is essentially giving you a Code Magazine subscription through your VSS subscription, formerly known as MSDN subscriptions. Uh, even if you're a free customer, uh, Dev Essentials customer is what Microsoft calls that if you're using Visual Studio Code and things like that through Dev Essentials, then you're also getting a free subscription. So we're not selling you anything. All this stuff is 
is free. Now we do already have our next stata.net on the calendar, also based on your feedback. It's gonna be September 20th. And we'll talk about AI, machine learning, cognitive services, image recognition, speech, uh, all kinds of AI and how it applies to business applications. Because in, in this day and age, I really can't think of a type of application or I'd have a hard time thinking of an application that cannot benefit from AI and machine learning and cognitive services at this point. So that's what we'll explore. And I think a lot of people will be surprised as to how useful this stuff is in the typical business app. So September 30th, I've seen a lot of people already signed up for this. So apparently there's a lot of interest in this. And again, this is something we got out of the feedback we got after the last data.net. So we really do listen to you. And that gets us to the Q&A portion. Um, let's see, I have a few things here. So there was a question about where Blazor was on the chart that showed the JavaScript frameworks. I just don't have that data yet. I guess Blazor would be a dot at the bottom right somewhere uh, over in the corner because we just haven't started seeing Blazor uptake yet and or, or haven't gotten that data yet. Uh, so we know there's a lot of interest because it's probably the most popular topic that we write and present about. But whether that will mean that the uh, market in general or the community in general is taking to it is, is still up in the air. So we'll see about that. Um, any comment about F sharp? Will it be fully supported in Blazor WebAssembly? Uh, no, not at this point. I don't know what their plans are for it. Right now it's a C sharp thing. Uh, there has been talk about other languages, but I, I'm not privy to knowing where that went. So I haven't heard anything about F sharp in Blazor, but you could of course build an F sharp assembly and, and just reference it from Blazor but I don't think he can expect anytime soon to put it into the actual HTML pages like he can C sharp. Question is, is there a state of Kubernetes? Uh, well, that'd be an interesting uh, state of .net. Please provide us feedback in the survey about that. Uh, there has been talk about the kind of a state of containerization in general and Kubernetes certainly would uh, would play into that. So if there's a lot of interest, let us know. Uh, and then maybe this will be one of the future topics, but we don't have it on the calendar yet. Uh, Cloud Foundry versus Kubernetes is a question. I don't know enough about Cloud Foundry. I haven't used that myself. Uh, from my point of view, Kubernetes is generally considered the winner, but I'm, I'm not qualified to talk about Cloud Foundry as such. Uh, GitHub and .NET application integration, do we have an article in Code Magazine? I would be inclined to say yes, but I'm, I don't know by heart whether there is one. ActiveX, <laughs> that's an old technology. Um, that's a calm technology, right? So that's legacy at this point. My view about OpenSilver, um, don't really know anything about it. And the uh, question is .NET 5, is that supposed to be a complete merge of framework and core or more like core with remaining miss, uh, missing features from framework? Yeah, it's more the latter, right? It's more going forward with core and bringing all the other features over, taking the best of all the worlds. Like when you think of um, the different .NET frameworks that are out there, right? we have .NET Core, we have uh, the micro framework, we have the full framework, we have the mono runtime, and they all have really good things that are only available there, right? So the Xamarin guys, for instance, did some really great stuff that's not available in .NET Core. And they're bringing all of that together, at least that's the goal, right? So, so that's, now will everything that was in the full framework be brought forward? No, uh, you know, so things like web forms or WCF came up earlier, right? So there's things like that, that that won't be there. What is the current technology for polling or long polling? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't have anything specific there to answer. Not, I guess not my area of expertise. Uh, if you have any, um, I guess if we had specific scenarios, maybe I could answer that better. And I could certainly give you an answer. So maybe follow up with us after 
the event. What are my thoughts on using Angular with .NET Core? Well, we do that a lot and it works really well. So we are using Angular as the front end, sometimes served up as part of a .NET Core app because you can end up creating uh, what we call a multi-spa where you have a bigger site and then some pages within it are, are web apps in itself and they get served up. And so we do that a little bit. We certainly use .NET Core as the back end to serve up data. That's probably the most common thing we do with Angular. Now, when we talk multi-spas, my feeling is Vue.js is easier to integrate into individual pages. Angular is more of a big thing and it makes one page. Uh, but yeah, you, you could still do it with Angular too. But yeah, it works very well. What excites me the most out of all the new technologies? Uh, well, specific to what we talked about today, I gotta say Blazor and WebAssembly. Um, it, it, I really like the idea of being more free in choosing what I want to use in the browser. And I like the idea of reusing code that I already had. Uh, so, so that appeals a lot to me. I think it's very exciting technology if it catches on. Because WebAssembly has been around for a while and it's being used a lot, but mostly game developers. So it's here to stay, it's caught on, but will it catch on for business apps? And if it does, I think that could be a big step forward for, for web development. Now, if we talk more about overall technologies, I think what we're going to talk about next month with with the cognitive services, things like image recognition or using AI to make predictions for sales or inventory management or all kind of language recognition, figuring out uh, a sentiment about what people are talking about online, about your product, that, that sort of stuff. That, that is, to me, very exciting and more useful than most people seem to think. Do we have anything new coming up for blend? Uh, expression blend, I'm assuming we're talking about. No, <laughs> that is what it is. You can still download that product for free from Microsoft and I use it a lot, actually. I like blend a lot for a lot of graphics things I do. Uh, same with, um, with expression design, but I don't see anything really new coming there. Somebody says they have an application running as a service on Windows Server that listens for data coming in over some communication channel. Can Blazor or Razor pages replace this? I, I don't think that's really a Blazor or Razor page thing. I think that's more of a sockets thing probably or something along those lines. Uh, and it probably, I would imagine, happens on the server. And so, yeah, you could call that from those technologies but there's nothing Blazor or Razor Pages does specifically to help you with that. Do you ever have to install anything on the browser to run a Blazor app? Nope, it just runs in the browser. So different from Silverlight, right? Silverlight required a special runtime. Uh, Blazor requires a browser. So a browser has to be installed, obviously, but nothing in the browser. There's no add-on, no runtime or anything like that. Can you uh, support calling Python script? Yes, absolutely. In fact, there's uh, a few really nice integration points to call to languages like Python. Um, is WebAssembly sandboxed in the browser? Yes, like JavaScript, essentially. It's the same rules as JavaScript. And can any .NET code be compiled to run in the browser? Not everything. So because you run in the sandbox, you are limited, right? So if you have code that accesses the registry, first of all, that would only work on Windows. And secondly, you can't, you're not allowed to do it. So, you know, calling out to install stuff is a problem. So Excel documents, if you want to do automation, probably not. Which one would you choose if you develop an e-commerce site, Razor Pages or MVC? I think probably Razor Pages is the default there, unless it's really sophisticated. Uh, but be also aware you can mix and match the two. So you could, if you wanted to, create an, a controller that is used for very few things, the, the more sophisticated ones, and do razor pages for everything else. Now, there's a little bit of difference in opinion of whether you should do that. It gets a little messier with the routes, and then you have two different paradigms in one site. We are doing it, uh, but there's different opinions on, 
on whether you whether it's clean architecture or not, I guess. Where does Entity Framework fall in this? Uh, is it fully migrated with .NET Core? Yes, it is. Um, there's a, a completely new version again, uh, very feature rich. We use it a lot. Changed a little bit from the full framework, uh, you know, especially when it comes to designers and stuff. But yeah, that's how you would likely access your data. So if you're building, say, a .NET Core API that accesses JSON data, or JSON and re that accesses data and returns it as JSON, the data access is probably Entity Framework. It doesn't have to be, but probably is. So we're already way over time. I think that's all the questions. Uh, as one late entry. Can WebAssembly include SQLite or something like that, IndexedDB? Yes, it can. Um, so anyway, if you have any more questions, I, I think our live stream is already way over time. Uh, feel free to contact us. More than happy to uh, respond to your questions. Help us out by filling in the survey so we know what you'd like to hear about in the future. And other than that, thank you very much for attending. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you'll be happily using .NET technology and browser technology to build your web applications. So thank you very much and goodbye.